I'm sorry, two weeks on the row, so you have to put up with me. Um, our guest today is James Holtz Reed of Aston Installations. Uh, I first met James in 2014 um, when I tried to get him to uh, connect my mobile phone to my 2003 Vanquish, which was a bit of a challenge for him. Um, and uh, I think it is testament to him that uh, his business has grown fantastically since then. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to James. And today's conversation is about all the things you can do with uh, in-car entertainment and other systems in your cars up to date. Uh, I think James is widely acknowledged as being the go-to man. <laughs> James, how did you Richard, get in thank this you. game? Richard, uh, thank you very much for the few kind words. Um, it has been an entertaining 15 years uh, of uh, playing with Aston Martins, to be fair. Uh, Maria, could you put the um, bung up the logo for a start, just so people know who we are? Um, a caveat in today, a lot of this stuff is what I've picked up as I've um, worked over the years. There are an awful lot of other products on the market, and I don't profess to know everything about everything. Um, so if anybody has a better, wiser way of doing it, then for us here, every day is a school day, and it's not just me running Aston installations. I have a, a cohort somewhere in the building, Lenny Knox as well. And we've got a couple of uh, new people started with us a lot. That's great, thanks Murray. Um, so that's who we are. Um, this company um, was formed back in 2017. Prior to that, I've been working for other people, but uh, doing uh, Aston Martin work on the side um, and just learning, learning the trade really. So Murray, if you go into um, image one, please, of a cow, um, to give people an idea, we used to travel all over the country uh, doing this sort of thing. And uh, up until uh, 2018, then uh, we were mobile and we would go to main dealers. We'd uh, work on people's driveways, people's garages. Sometimes it was out in the rain, all the weathers. And hopefully in a minute, you'll see that some of the stuff, if we needed cover, we'd literally take it wherever we could. Um, but at least it was warm and out of the wind. So, um, yeah, really, that's how it all started. Um, and over the years, I've sort of bumped along with main dealers, specialists from Pete Martin, you saw last week, uh, AML Performance, um, no plugs mentioned, Nicholas Mee, um, and the great and the good of the Aston world. Okay. Well, um, James, uh, it, it's very nice to, to, to find somebody else who's sort of built themselves an Aston business slowly, and it's great. Um, but I think probably what would be most helpful to the members who are on today, Aston have changed the what was installed in the cars quite substantially over the years, going through, obviously, um, Vanquish, then DB9, then the Vantage V8s and things. Um, so as we... I think most of us know originally they were sort of Jaguar type systems. Then there was a Volvo system and so on. Could you could you take us through perhaps the model changes and and when the in car changed and and what the limitations are on that? Sure. Loosely, as you said, the Vanquish uh, was built around a, a Jaguar based Alpine um, uh, system. Um, what they called AI net, albeit that when I spoke to Alpine, it wasn't quite their system and it wasn't quite a Jaguar system. It was a bit of a hybrid of the two. Um, and the way that it networks together, certainly on Vanquish, is a little bit odd. And it does make for upgrading and adding things on a little bit more difficult. Um, and it's, I mean, the DB7 is slightly predates that. that that's a pretty much a standard system um, in some of the cars that you can upgrade the head unit to a later DAB radio. Um, whereas with the Vanquish, you're pretty limited in what you can do. Although we are developing ideas, we're looking at uh, having a touch screen, certainly on the later cars of the Vanquish S when they went to the um, MOST system, which I'll explain in a minute. So the later Vanquish S, uh, when they had the screen built into it, so I think it was 2006 and a half onwards, 2007 cars. But when I mentioned the MOST system, so if you um, imagine a, a, a network of um, components linked via light. So fiber optic, um, the MOST system stands for Media Orientated System Transport. And it's a data bus of information traveling around the car, um, giving you navigation information, music, um, and the infrastructure of the infotainment system. So 
it starts with the um, radio display or ICM as they call it, infotainment control module. And it then loops down into um, potentially depending on the version of car, the iPod, sorry, the, the um, Bluetooth module, uh, which is above the accelerator pedal, uh, then into the CD changer, down the center of the car to uh, outboard sides, both on left and right from the amplifiers, uh, GPS control units, and the radio tuner, which is above the wheel arch on the uh, right hand side, over to the navigation control module, if you have it fitted on the left hand side. And that closed loop then carries all the transport information of um, satellites, navigation, music, uh, audio, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is then how Vantage, DB9, DBS, Repeat, all the Gaiden models are built on, and that's uh, basically how the infotainment system is structured together. Now, um, there are, sorry, Richard, do you want a quick question? Well, is, so, so that would be the system that people refer to as the Volvo system. Correct, yes. Yeah. Now, there are, um, various uh, changes through the model year. So from 2004, uh, when DB9 first came in the UK, up to 2008, it's all pretty much the same system. So it's a Volvo-based uh, navigation system. Uh, in DB9, they had three levels of amplification. It was uh, level one, two, and three, one being the 120 watts, um, two, level two being 260, and level three being the 950. Now, that denoted the power output of the amplifier and also how many speakers were in the car. So the basic 120 in a DB9 had two front speakers in the two front doors and a rear sub between the two rear seats. 260 then went on two front and rear speakers with um, a sub between the rear seats. And then 950 uh, added more power and a front center speaker as well by the windscreen and gave you what they call the, the um, 5.1 surround sound. Now, Vantage was slightly different. They only had two levels one of which was a 160 watt. So again, front speakers and a sub, but this time the sub was an enclosed box behind the passenger seat on, on UK cars, and also behind the driver's seat on, on um, left-hand drive cars. Um, and then they went to the 700 watt system, uh, which is rather than the DB9 was a, a sort of LIN based system, they went to Volvo Stroke Alpine uh, on the Vantage. So uh, the 700 watt system had front center speaker, uh, two front door speakers, uh, two rears, and a more powerful sub. And then outboard on the right-hand side in the boot were two amplifiers, one to run the sub and one to run the other five channels. Um, the, the more basic 160 watt then only had one amplifier to do the whole lot. One of the common questions we get asked a lot is, I've got standard sound 160, can I go to premium sound? And, and yes, you can. You can buy all the factory components um, cost-wise around about 1400 pounds, I believe. Uh, you need to then tell the car with a config file, which is about 40 pounds or so, program the car up with your local main dealer. Um, and then all of a sudden you've got a, a premium sound system in it. Okay. Now, over the years, um, certainly I found in my Vanquish and others that components fail so perhaps it would be useful at this point to talk about what, what failures you've seen, because I would imagine they're common or, or, or reasonably common across cars um, uh, and, and, and where there are known problems and, and how you identify them. So for example, I think somebody suggested that one of the things you had to do was if you're driving a Vantage and you wanted to understand why it wasn't playing sound on one side, you stamp your feet. So perhaps you can explain about that, James. There is. A, I'll, I'll give a, a couple of pointers on that one. Maria, could you go um, JHR pick two up, please, for a moment? Um, just while this slide's coming up, um, what I want to do is this is what the MOST fibre cables look like. Now, these work really well. Now, Richard, I'll come on to the, um, the, the foot stamping fix in a minute because that's quite technical um, for yourself. So I need to just cover it in detail. But basically, if any component on that orange cable links together fails for whatever reason, either through no power or through a failure of a component, then the whole system shuts down. And we've had quite a few recently, and it could be anything from most commonly the GPS control unit. And that's a little box that sits uh, in the wheel arch on the Vantage. And 
it talks to the satellites, interprets the data it's been given, and then squirts that down the fiber cables to the navigation module so that this car can see how many satellites it can see in the sky. And for some reason, they fail more regularly than other things. And when it shuts down, the whole system shuts down. But what a lot of people misunderstand is they think it's the navigation module that's failed and you're looking at a price of two and a half thousand pound ish for a navigation module or 300 pounds for the gps control unit so i do suggest to people that if all of a sudden things have the, the radio doesn't turn on begin to look at the gps control unit first and you can soon um with a test loop just loop out that particular component on the fiber network and then try the car again and see if it wakes up. Um, the other common um, item we get, uh, but only on Vantage, uh, because of the way that the Bluetooth system is set up, is the um, there's a switcher interface in the passenger footwell. And in uh, Aston's wisdom, when they designed it, it was built in, al in an aluminium container so that the it condensates on the inside and the, com the relay um, contacts get dirty. So periodically on Vantage, you'll lose either left or right hand front speaker, which is where the telephone would normally play from. By stamping your feet in the footwell, that then rattles the contacts. And all of a sudden, if you then get the speaker working again, you know full well that that uh, component has gone down, that the, the switcher interface has gone down. And, and it's a simple replacement job that we actually make for Aston Martin themselves. However, DB9, is different again because the although they use the same bluetooth module on the early cars it is wired directly into the amplifier so if you begin to get a speaker go on a db9 say for instance it's more likely that the speaker's gone not the switcher interface okay now um one of the other common things we get asked about is what can we do in respect of um DB9 problems. There are a few of them, one of which is what we call ladder noise. And it's basically that the amplifier begins to fail. And as you turn the volume up and down, you hear the noise of the volume control sort of chattering over the top of the speakers. And we've begun to find more and more that the amp these uh, LIN amplifiers are getting a little bit uh, tired, I suppose, if want of a better word. They're getting a little bit they're failing more, more regularly. Now, unfortunately, because they're um, short supply, uh, they are getting very, very expensive to replace. Um, now, there are a couple of options you can do. Uh, because of the way that Aston have configured this fiber optic system, uh, you need to be able to read that fiber network to give it to an amplifier to make noise out of the speakers. Now, we do it in one of two ways. Either uh, you can change it for what we call a Mobridge device, which is uh, an interface module that will take the fiber optic MOST information from the car and convert that to a normal RCA phono output that any other amplifier from any aftermarket manufacturer will understand. So we put that in the loop, then an aftermarket amplifier, and that then feeds into the existing system with the same speakers, and you wouldn't know there's any difference to the car. It works in exactly the same way. There's another company called Audison. Now, they do a similar system, but you have to keep the original amplifier in situ because the system doesn't work unless it sees the original amp. It doesn't see it as a, as a complete unit. Um, that makes the installation a little bit more difficult because if your amplifier has failed completely, obviously you don't have a working uh, MOST converter built in the amplifier. So if you're doing a, a, just a normal upgrade because you've got a system that isn't very powerful, then you could use the Audison device into a separate amplifier. Um, however, if you've got one that's failed completely, then I'd say use the Mobridge device instead. Uh, and that way, then you can um, completely replace the original amplifier and have a working system again for broadly less money than changing the amplifier completely. Uh, I think last uh, quote I was looking at for uh, say 260 watt, I think it was three and a half thousand pounds for the amplifier. And they wanted a thousand pound surcharge um, to get the original amplifier back again. I may be wrong on that one, so I'll um, bow to anybody's uh, further information on that one. Okay. So, James, I think 
um, if I speak from myself, um, I've got a 2003 Vanquish. Um, it's got the Lin system, which is the oldest system in it. And what I wanted to do, and this is why I talked to you in the very first place, was I wanted to be able to integrate my phone into the car. And, and we did a very early basic system. But I think where most people who are on this call probably are, is they're wondering if it's possible to integrate their smartphone, um, their, uh, you know, Apple Play or Android Play or uh, how do you get ways to work and things like that. So perhaps if, if, if you talk through that, but talk through it in terms of the generations of systems that are in the car, you okay. know, what you've um, going back to the Vanquish originally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's on uh, a Jaguar Alpine AI net system. That is pretty much unavailable now, anything else to plug into. And bear in mind that the cars were built and finished prior to any sort of smartphone, iPod type device coming out. So it's quite limited in what you can do with that. However, what you can do is you can integrate a, a basic telephone system because the, the Jaguar head unit that's in your car, for instance, Richard, um, does have a direct telephone input to it, but it's only a mono system. It'll come up with phone on the radio display and you can turn the volume up and down on the steering wheel if you have um, buttons on it or on the head unit. Uh, and that way it'll play via the front speakers and, and give you some sort of noise as a connectivity that way. If you want to add in something like uh, music playing, a little bit more complicated, but what we have done is to break into the cable between the CD changer and the amplifier in the boot and using um, a, a hands-free kit that would play music and voice, we can then make that all work together again. It's a little bit of a complicated system and convoluted, but it's something I have done on three or four occasions to, to bring the car slightly more up to date. Now, moving on to um, gate era cars, for instance, uh, anything between 2004 and 2008, or 7.5 up to that model year, there was nothing in the car apart from a CD changer and radio, um, AM, FM. Uh, 2008, or sort of 7.5, 7.75 model year and 8, they changed the armrests from a basic flat armrest to a, one with cup holders in, uh, and a lift up armrest. And at that point, then Aston added uh, iPod connectivity and a USB socket. Uh, that then changed when 2009 model year came out to a, when the glass key dashboard came out, that they would have a 3.5 mil jack uh, as well as the iPod and USB connectivity. Now, one of the simplest ways to add music streaming, for instance, um, on the cable that you normally plug your iPod into, which is the wide 30 pin, the old, old, old connector, you can get a Bluetooth streaming device called a Bovi Tune to Air, and that essentially allows you to stream music straight to the car. So you simply press the mode button on the dash, select iPod, plug the Bovi in, pair your phone to it, and then play music from Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, uh, radio stations, whatever you like to do. The other option you've got on 09 model year onwards as well is you can upgrade the Bluetooth module itself um, to Aston. Now, I think it's around about £500-ish, uh, don't put me on that one, but that then gives you a later model um, Bluetooth module. It has a bigger phone book memory. You can pair two phones at once, and also then you can stream music straight to the car, so that's the factory solution. Um, costings, both is about £95, I believe, uh, and the uh, factory upgrade is about 500 Now, as Richard said, what we're doing a lot of at the moment is to um, integrate uh, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is sort of the next iteration of how far can we go. Now, what drove that is the navigation system on the Gaiden era cars, the Volvo system, hasn't, isn't the best in the world. And certainly in current um, cars from Ford, Audi, um, Daihatsu, whoever, you've, you can then connect your phone to the car. So you then use your phone apps from ways to Google Maps to Apple Maps to Sidejet to whomsoever. But also then you have capability of having text messages read to you. Um, you can talk to Siri or Google Assist. Uh, it will play uh, internet radio stations, so the similar sort of thing from, from DAB. Uh, but the first iteration of that was actually to mirror 
a smartphone onto the navigation. And certainly we did a lot of those, but it was limited in respect that we couldn't get the audio into the car without some other device, um, like uh, the Dentian unit that a lot of people have used, um, or any other sort of integration to the, the fiber optic system. Um, but certainly the CarPlay at the moment has, has uh, been a revelation for a lot of people because they can take the phone out of their perhaps day-to-day -day car um, with all their contact details on, with their locations, with their music, uh, any sort of connectivity you, you've got to the outside world, uh, plug it into your Aston and you have that same system all the way through um, in your Aston as well with a better navigation system. Now, um, what then lets it down is the screen resolution. So again, we're working on that one to put a high definition screen in, which is also the plan for the uh, late model Vanquish as well, that where you've got the screen in, in the top of the dash, like the DB9, um, we wanna put a touch screen, um, high definition screen in there to give better connectivity of, um, of um, telephone as well. Okay. Now, uh, James, I think you're behind on pictures, so... I am want... very much so. My apologies. I've been carried away. We're talking too much. Shall we, shall we stream some of the pictures and talk over some of the pictures here? Of course, yeah. Um, if you could, Maria, put up um, picture JHR pick three Vantage, please, for me. And to give you an idea, this is a, a Vantage in pieces. This was fitting uh, an iPod kit or Dentsian Gateway 500 to it. And in effect, what we had to do was to remove the entire center stack, as they call it, so the radio display and CD changer, which would normally sit in the big hole in the middle, uh, and reroute the fiber optics. So when I spoke about the fiber optic loop earlier, if you want to add in um, a, another auxiliary source, say from an early iPod kit or USB or whatever, you would need to break into that fiber cable and complete the loop. And the Dentsian Gateway 500 would give us the ability to do that. Uh, and certainly over the years, I've fitted an awful lot on them. And I was actually uh, the guy that got Dentsian over from Hungary to the press workshop at Gaiden. And we, they data logged the fiber optics to find out what made it tick and how to make it work in an Aston. Um, it's broadly similar to the Volvo system, but with just a few slight quirks in it. Um, but that was the sort of first connectivity option with it that would give you display on the radio still so you could see what track was playing and so on and we still use them to this day because they're just robust and reliable and um, it does what it says on the tin. Um, could I have a uh, pick four please Maria? Now as I mentioned earlier about the different audio systems uh, this is the amplifier from a, a 160 watt um, system uh, so these are quite commonly found on eBay and various other sites they're very reliable, um, so it, it's unlikely to get one of these fail, whereas the ones in the DB9 do fail a little bit more often. Uh, but we take this one out and put two in its place when we're doing the premium sound upgrade uh, system. Um, now, obviously, when you saw in the previous slide, the car does come to pieces quite a bit to, to put a lot of the cabling in. Um, we've done quite a few now, but I don't think anything came quite close to uh, pick five, if you wouldn't mind, Maria, if you put GHR pick five up. Um, this is the complete interior of the DBS uh, that was brought in from Dubai. And I thought it would make a pretty picture just to show people what's involved, really. There's 67 different panels um, when we began to take it to pieces. And the customer wanted a complete color change. So every one of these panels was stripped back to bear and then recovered in obsidian leather uh, with contrast blue stitching. So that was a winter mission a couple of years back uh, as to um, uh, how we were doing things. Now, uh, Maria, could you go on to JHR pick seven, please? Oh, that'll do. Six is, no, six is fine, six is good. So when I spoke about um, uh, various audio upgrades, um, we also try and make it slightly better than the original. Now, as you see in that one, that's from a 2006 DB9 that the amplifier had failed on. Now, all the silver stuff, uh, that's there is it's commonly known as Dynamat, and it's a sound deadening system that prevents everything from rattling and, and resonating in the car. Now, when we uh, what I found with um, DB9 installations is that the, the base can be quite soft and subtle. 
and a lot of customers like it to be a bit more punchy, um, a bit crisper. So by doing that, obviously, it's going to make things rattle. So we have to then make sure that it doesn't. So by adding Dynamite to everything, uh, it then just keeps the rattle to a bare minimum uh, before we put all the panels back on again. So if you could now go on to uh, pick seven, please, Maria. So this is the uh, Audison system I spoke of earlier. Um, and this is before uh, I realized we needed to keep the original uh, amplifier in situ. This is obviously a, a, a big learning curve um, when we're doing this sort of thing. Uh, but as you can see, it's quite involved in respect to the wiring on there. Uh, but no, none of the customers, you wouldn't ever see this because this is buried behind uh, the carpeting uh, in, in the boot section. Um, but yeah, that was uh, one of the uh, one of the DB nines we did a, a upgrade on. <coughs> so moving on to CarPlay briefly, uh, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, we're developing a new screen system as well, which is still a work in progress. Um, slightly slower than I'd anticipated, but it's quite involved. If you go on to pick eight, uh, please, Maria. Um, this is what we're doing so far. So this would be the, the sort of bare screen assembly, um, but it's gonna be built into the existing uh, folding screen. So it will look completely standard. Uh, aesthetically, whenever we try and do anything with an Aston, we try and keep the cabin as, as, as clean as possible and certainly as standard as possible as we possibly can. Not always possible, I know. Um, we try and, have it in keeping as much as possible with the car. Now, going on to uh, pick nine, please, Maria. Uh, this is one of the work in progress. So you can see it does come down to wires and circuit boards and trying to make the best of it. Now, this was a, the sort of first design we thought about, um, but since then we've junked most of the stuff that you see in the bottom of the picture with the blue circuit board and the Vero board and so on. And we've now compressed all of that purely into the back of the screen. So everything will feed in the back of the screen. So the idea is that if anybody wants to have CarPlay with a new screen, they'll take out their original screen, send it to us, we'll modify it and send it back as a complete kit with CarPlay, stroke Android Auto and an updated screen, which will simply plug into existing connectors on the car. So that's what we're working for. And hopefully we'll have that beginning of um, 2021. Okay. This is just a, a closer up picture of the um, of the amplifier that was in the previous DB9. So again, you can see the amount of Dynamat um, sound dander we put around it. Quite why Aston decided to put it on an aluminium plate which flexes and resonates and so on, I don't know. Uh, certainly on the Volante, they changed it to a, what they call a quartered box. So it was actually a solid casing, um, which was far, far better. But certainly in, in the early cars, they just had this flimsy aluminium plate uh, to hold the big speaker in. Um, but certainly when we're changing amplifiers, we tend to change the sub at the same time uh, because oftentimes we find the sub causes problems with the amplifiers. So the sub goes uh, short, uh, short circuit, and then takes the amplifier out with it. So oftentimes we have to change them as a pair. Now, um, just while I'm covering screens as well, if you go on to pick 11 momentarily, some of you may have seen that the, this is from a later vantage, uh, which we can now add car plate as well which has a much better screen to it so we're trying to get the existing cars also the, the vh platform cars so the the gaiden built um early vantage uh 2005 onwards to this sort of clarity so that's our mission so far to be able to do that does that cover it richard for you yeah i think so i mean i think james it's fair to say that there are other products on the market which do components of this and things and and when when we're talking about this James you know we we recognize that that you're very definitely at the higher end totally integrated and everything else but I think it's it's also useful to say here that um, you don't have to go to Tewkesbury to get all of this fitted yeah. Um, Peter Martin was talking last week about how he's an appointed agent and perhaps James you talk about where else and for example there's a question on here um, on the chat just now saying how can Avantage V8 owner based in Paris have access to Aston Insulation's expertise without having to cross the channel. Um, we've, so, 
we've had a number of people who've traveled up. We're very keen to um, have other installers understand our system. Um, not that it is beyond many people. I mean, it, what we've tried to do is make one harness, one cable harness that everything plugs into. So rather than multiple points of connection around a car to the reversing lights and to this and to that and the other, is we've made one harness that plugs into the cabin fuse box, the SEM, for, for, for want of a better word. And all of our components then plug into that. So it's easier for either um, a, a, a qualified owner to be able to do it themselves if they're in Australia, say, but also for ourselves and also for other people. So we've got Pete Martin in Scotland who traveled down and worked with us for a couple of days to uh, learn uh, how we did things and what we did. Um, also, uh, AML Performance in Macclesfield, uh, Fisher Performance in Troywich, um, Andrew Weller from Nicholas Me um, in Hatfield, they've been over, um, as have um, Josh Pierce, as has um, uh, Paul Hill from Phoenix, Aston Martin in Basingstoke. So they've all come up for training, they understand, and they are our sort of authorised agents for doing the sort of thing through us. But as, as Richard alluded to, there are lots of other bits and pieces on the market. We don't profess to know everything, do everything um, for Aston Martin. And certainly there are a lot of other people doing a lot of fantastic work. Certainly if anybody's got any questions about, will this, I bought this thing, will it fit on my car? Get in touch. We can have a discussion about it and see the best way of connecting to it. Um, and certainly abroad, uh, we've got um, a chap in northern France between Calais and Paris, um, Frederic from Go Far Sal. Uh, he came over on his own time to learn what we did. Uh, we've got Ali Robertson, who's just by Nürburgring. Uh, there's uh, um, Carol Koch in um, Zurich. We've got a couple of guys in Australia, um, chap in New Zealand, um, several dotted across uh, the US. So we have points of contact. Um, and certainly with installers, we, we do very detailed instructions on, on what, we do, what we have. And I spend quite a lot of time on video calls explaining how the car comes to bits, where to plug in and so on. And being there to offer backup and support, um, not only on our products, but certainly on Aston's in general, infotainment systems about uh, what we've done before, what people are trying to do, what can be done, what can't be done. Um, and as I said, every day is a school day. And um, I learn as much as from other engineers that say, if you try it this way, it works far better. Uh, and certainly I'm all for that. But yes, we've we've got bits and we've got a, quite a few people around the world then. Okay. I mean, I think it, it, it's probably fair to summarise it by saying that on the older cars, particularly things like the older Vanquish or the early uh, VH cars, your options are more limited because essentially people have not anticipated um, people using smartphones and ways and stuff like that. Uh, the more modern cars coming out of the factory anticipate that and Apple Play and Android Play and things are are built into the systems or relatively easy to build in. And they are in a lot of new cars, Richard, you're absolutely right. Um, mm. and, but it's only DBX, uh, the new uh, SUV that Aston have recently launched that actually comes with Apple CarPlay standard. Having said the slight caveat in that, uh, Aston... Um, Going back to the, to the model year changes, if I may slightly, um, 2008 uh, to the went to iPod integration. Um, in 2012, Virage was the first one, late 11 model year. They then changed from a Volvo navigation system to uh, Garmin based with a far better resolution screen. Now that was carried all the way through right to when they finished sort of VH platform manufacturers, the same screen. But in 2016, uh, yeah, um, they went to a system called AMI2, which used the way to tell you, they went to the waterfall dash, as they call it, little haptic buttons on it. Um, now, that got better integration with it. Um, and certainly, 17 model year, AMI3 came out, and that offered a wired CarPlay system a standard, but it's the only one that Aston ever did. And it was built by a company called Skyships out of, I believe, Colchester Way, Chelmsford Way. Um, very, very clever guys that have done bits with Pagani um, as well. Um, but that's the only time that Aston actually had CarPlay fitted to any of their vehicles. It was in the Vantage 
uh, and Vanquish, I think, were the only two model ranges they did before it. Uh, after that, they then went on to uh, the second century cars, so uh, New Vantage, um, DB11, Superleger, and so on. And that's a um, older Mercedes-Benz system that would predate when you could add um, Apple CarPlay onto it. So the only way to do anything with that one is to actually add on a separate box to it, um, which does mean taking the car to pieces again, like you've seen in some of the earlier slides. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a mission to, uh, to install that again. Okay, but James, just to be clear, so when, when they went to that early Mercedes-Benz system, as mm -hmm. you say, with the, the new Vantage and the DB11, you can put Apple CarPlay in there, yes, can. but yes. it's, yeah. it's a bigger job. Okay. It, it, it's, it's a job, again, yes, um, but the great thing is with it, um, that you don't have any extra controls because the way that modern cars work on uh, CAN data or controller area network, another acronym, uh, is that we can utilize the existing controls to control CarPlay. So it's a, it's a, a, a three second press on control buttons and that goes from the existing system to CarPlay um, using an existing screen and then it works um, pretty seamlessly as if it had been there from day one. Okay, so th this obviously for everybody who's listening, this is this is quite a sort of complicated subject. And what I what I'm going to suggest that people do is, if you have very specific questions about can I fit X or Y to a 2009 model year um, DBS or whatever it is, if those questions are either fired at me, um, so membership at amot.org, or posted on the forum, um, and we'll set up a new one. I will try and get you answers from James as to as to what is possible, or you can go direct to James. It's it's up to you. Um, I want to move it on a little bit because there are a number of questions today about um, parking and reversing cameras. And the very okay. first thing I saw James do was actually fit a little camera in the front of the car to stop. Uh, well, it wasn't me, it was someone else, but to stop him busting his chin spoiler on the curb by parking too close to it um, and then were reversing you, cameras. So perhaps you can talk about that. Were you watching me driving one day? Was that what it was? <laughs> no, you were fitting it to um, Phil Ye's car, Casterman's yes, car. No, the, very the, early. Whole reason that, the whole reason that came about is I was lucky enough to have a DB9 on loan from the factory. I was doing some other work a long, long time ago. And I couldn't see where the bonnet finished because uh, being a short ass, it was a bit more difficult to see where the, um, how long the car was. And I drove, uh, put the f nose over a curbstone. Um, the car was a bit of a wreck anyway, but basically I took a chunk out of the bumper when I reversed back off the curbstone. And it got me thinking, how on earth can I make all this? How can I see, apart from a white flag on the front? Um, I want to be able to see where the front end is. So I began to um, break the uh, navigation screen and how could I get into it? And this really drove everything else with respect to mirror and car play and what had been done since then. The, the camera system was the, the first iteration. So Maria, if you could go on to uh, slide 16, please momentarily, JHR pick 16. Um, this gives an idea of what uh, we can do um, imminently, hopefully. Um, but in effect, we put a camera on the front end purely so that you can drive up close to something. And this comes up through the same navigation screen uh, controlled with a separate switch on it. Now, uh, it looks like, Maria, if you go to uh, pick 14, please, for me. We try and make it as uh, clean as possible. This is sort of lying down on the floor as much as possible, but it sits just by the old cooler grill just there um, and then shows up on the navigation screen. Now, this particular one, has four different angles. So with a, a press button um, buried in the ashtray or, or similar, um, you can look down as if you're lying on the bonnet, you can look left and right coming out of blind junctions and it'll give you a wide angle view and rotate around the whole thing. And then Maria, if you go to uh, picture 15, please for me, um, we can also fit the reverse camera that, that's then automated. Um, now this is on advantage as you see N430 uh, it can be fitted to anything from uh, 2006, 7 uh, Vanquish with the upgraded screen or the DB9 screen, uh, all the way through any of the models from uh, 
Gen 2 Vanquish, um, DB9, V Advantage, Rapide, the whole thing. So any of them and every, all of them can have uh, front and rear cameras. You've got a factory reverse camera, which a lot of the later cars have, uh, then we can soon add, add on a forward facing camera to it as well and works in conjunction with the existing system. Okay. So um, certainly I've seen uh, front and, and rear cameras on a 2006 Vanquish. Um, and um, I know there are some people on here who've got older Vanquishes. Um, uh, we have One a- One thing, Richard, just, just while yeah. you're saying older, older Vanquishes like yours, we, we have had a few um, whereby they don't have a screen built in. So we had a couple of the advantages come through without navigation also DB9s, and they're saying, well, I don't really need navigation, but I'd love a reverse camera. And that's certainly possible. What we've done before is um, where the rear view mirror is situated, we've um, modified that um, with a mirror monitor, as they call it. So it, it basically replaces the existing uh, rear view mirror with one that has a small three inch monitor built into it. And that automatically uh, switches to reverse camera uh, whenever you hit reverse. But when you come out of reverse, it looks like a normal uh, rear view mirror. So there's always that option as well. And certainly we've done that on, like I say, a few cars that don't have a uh, factory navigation system. Okay. So um, perhaps James, let's, let's just go slightly off piste at this point. Um, what, what have you done for other things, perhaps sort of um, tariff, um, you know, the, the slightly weirder things that are more interesting? Yeah, I don't know how many people have heard of a, a Taraf. Uh, it was a Lagonda um, Taraf, uh, which is uh, in effect based on the Rapide uh, four-door um, thing. Quite a um, spectacular car. Uh, so we've, we've certainly we put a mirror, uh, iPhone mirror into that one so that the gentleman could run his um, navigation system into the original screen. Uh, we've also got involved with um, working on GT12, which was slightly intimidating um v600 uh cars we've uh put trackers into uh because they didn't because being qu quite a number of specials come out of the factory don't have um vehicle trackers built into them and i'll, I'll richard remind me about trackers in a minute because i just want to say something yeah. about brief as well um but also if you uh, maria could you have a quick look at um picture 17 for me please uh, we did get involved with the secret Aston Martin factory as well, momentarily. Um, we've been asked to track a Vulcan. Now, when I got the call from Tracker, um, I was quite surprised because being a track only car, you wouldn't have thought they would have had a need for a tracker to be installed. But this particular one um, was um, the insurance company requested it. So um, we came running to help. Uh, and this is the one that Jeremy Clarkson drove on the Grand Tour. And it was actually the, the week it was being shown on, on Amazon um, Prime. It was the same week that I had this one in pieces. It had come back in from filming and all the body panels had been removed to uh, be repainted, to have all stone chips taken off again from Mr. Clarkson and so. Um, ready to go back onto it again. So if you go to picture 18, please, Maria. This is then the, uh, the small production line of them there. Um, final assembly being built, ready for handover and so on. Uh, and finally, picture 19, please, Maria. And I was lucky enough to be able to sit in it, providing I didn't have my shoes on, as you can see, my uh, besocked feet. Um, but yeah, quite a stunning piece of engineering, I must admit, and uh, very lucky to be able to work on one of those. Um, so yeah. That's at Wellsbourne. Um, I, I am not at liberty to say, I'm afraid. So. Okay, well, I think I can say, because I know where it is, but... <laughs> <laughs> but the other um, one, uh, we, we've actually worked on a DB4 GT continuation as well. My co-director, Lenny Knox, uh, worked on that one. Uh, that was fascinating in respect that they had built it completely to period. So when he got his toolbox out with all the metric spanners, nothing fitted. <laughs> okay. Um, come back to, to trackers, James, because yes, one indeed. of the things that... Peter Martin talked about last week was uh, battery drain and mm. different cars seem to work in different ways. So perhaps just talk about that a little bit. Okay, so uh, when uh, DB9 came out in 2004, they originally were fitted with the uh, Horizon system from Tracker. And that lasted for about a year and a half until um, mid 2005 when the Vantage was launched. Uh, and they both went over to 
um, what most people know as the Eurowatch system. That's actually the monitoring station, a uh, monitoring company that's owned by Teletrack Nelsman. Now, the trackers themselves were built by Autotext in Canada, and it was a brilliant idea because it was one of the only systems that you could bond your phone to via Bluetooth. So rather than carrying around horrible old looking around for one, can't find one, um, tracker tags, you could actually pair your phone with it. And it's one of the very few you could do, I think it was the only one you could do it with. Unfortunately, the some of the components on the circuit board weren't of the highest quality. And over the years, these components have begun to break down. Now, it's not the tracker that flattens the battery. Um, the trackers on the CAN network again, this, this is another acronym. Um, and it talks to the central electronic module. And if there's any problem with the tracker, it then reports back and will prevent the car from starting, which is all part of the category five stipulations that it has to have immobilization. Unfortunately, when these components go down, um, it doesn't allow the tracker to go to sleep properly. So the SEM, in its wisdom, will keep talking to the tracker saying, are you there, are you there, are you there? And of course, the tracker can't respond. So in effect, the, the SEM stays awake, and that obviously consumes power. So it's not unknown for um, a car to be flat within a couple of days. Um, now, the it also does cause other strange warning lights to come on, but that's further down the road. Now, what tends to happen in stages is, one, uh, the, the Eurowatch tracking station lose communication with the car so they cannot talk to it anymore and they get no response so that's stage one stage two is where you begin to get battery drain which if you're running on a condition you tend not to notice there's only if you go away on holiday leave at the airport or whatever come back and it's gone flat uh, stage three is slightly worse um is it then uh emulates its, its cat five system and just won't allow the car to start at all so that's like dead gone, won't work at all, car won't start. It can be then disconnected. However, if you just unplug it, the car thinks it's been stolen and will prevent the car from starting after the second attempt. So you need to electronically disconnect it as well. So once you've pulled the plug on the tracker, you can then uh, plug in AMDS to it. Now, um, the guys I mentioned before, so Pete Martin, AML, uh, Fisher, uh, any main dealer can do this. Uh, and it's basically uh, reflash the car as new, and it then doesn't look for the tracker on the circuit anymore, so it just starts as normal. And then if you need uh, to have a tracker fitting, then there are plenty of people around that can do it. Um, I would say just be mindful to make sure they have experience of taking an Aston to pieces. Um, not everybody does, and certainly I do get regular calls from other engineers I've known over the years saying, look, I've got a DBS how does it come to bits? Where can I put the tracker? What do I do? Where do I check the power from? That sort of thing. So just be comfortable that any tracker company you use uh, does have experience of your particular car. If not, get in touch with Richard or myself, uh, and we can certainly point you in the direction of people, um, ourselves, uh, wherever you are in the UK. Now, just to, I hasten to add, um, it was a factory fitted, uh, not an option, but it was factory fitted to every Aston built between 2004 and 2013, the Autotext unit. 2013 onwards, they went to the Vodafone device. 2017, it was then uh, a cost option. So you then had Vodafone, but you had to then had to pay for it on top. Okay. Um, I think what James and I probably need to do after this, this call is we'll we'll do a list of things like he's just said which is these were the devices fitted for these years to these cars um, and we'll put that up on the forum okay um, so that hopefully people will have a, a, a crib sheet if you want to call it that um, of what's in cars and and what might cause a problem um, it is interesting um, We've been looking at the problems with the engine management system on the Vanquish, where um, the original Vanquish, where it won't um, it won't run one bank, um, and again, this is down to electronic components on the board, um, particularly old-fashioned uh, electrolytic capacitors, which uh, which fail. And I don't know if those are the things that James has got on. Okay, so. Um,
In the questions that have been asked, um, and I, I don't know whether James can comment on this, there was a question asked about wrapping. Um, James, do you want to talk about that, or is that completely outside your field? Slightly outside our field. Um, I sort of pick up on bits and pieces from um, other owners uh, and from detailers. Uh, wrapping is a great way of protecting the front of the car or certainly the stone chippy end. Um, it can show up if you have existing stone chips. This is just a conversation I've had with other people. If you have existing stone chips on the car, having a wrap on it can accentuate those um, chips. So if you're going to wrap a car, get it painted first. But if you paint a car, leave it a good three weeks before you put a wrap on it. So yeah. to let the paint harden. Aston paint is notoriously soft and um, it can cause problems if you put a wrap on fresh paint. Okay. Um, there are then a, a, a series of other questions where people are asking things like, I'm driving a 2010 DB9 uh, or Virage DB9. Um, does the new system run through the AUX mode on the infotainment system? Um, meaning that if I'm listening to the radio through the normal FM mode on the infotainment system, it may not allow sound from the apps to interrupt like waves and so on. So, Correct. Yes. Yes. We use the auxiliary port on um, 2009 onwards cars is something I um, mentioned earlier, that anything 09 onwards with the last key has an auxiliary port. So we use that um, by pressing the motor button. So you go through from iPod USB um, auxiliary, and that's our input to the system for the CarPlay sound. So in effect, yes, that is correct. If you're listening to radio uh, and had ways on the screen, you wouldn't get any audio prompts. However, um, you could listen to radio through radio apps from radio player, tune in, BBC sounds, etc., etc., um, through the CarPlay system and get the prompts as well uh, if you wished. Okay. All right. Um, so um, there was a question here from uh, Osh Bernard about France, and I think you said you had a uh, rep in in somewhere between Calais and Paris. Yep. So, um, so we get Osh, them in touch with you... Frederic. Um, and... Yeah get Frederick to look after the client. Yep, that's great. Okay, so that, that would be good. So that answers that one. Um, and I, I think there are some very specific questions um, being asked today on the chat, uh, James. And I think I think to try and answer them very specifically on this is is going to be slightly complicated. But I, I uh, and I don't think we'll get to all of them. But um, I think the key thing to get across to people here is that um, uh, James is probably the pioneer in this market and has done a lot of things. And as you heard, he was the person that asked and asked to go and do the Vulcan or um, do other things. So he's considered to be the preeminent leader. And, and I think that's a fair comment on it, pushing the envelope. Um, certainly, I'm planning to work with him on the older vanquishes to do uh, a retrofit that gives you modern ICE. Um, and that means a new um, uh, system. But but again, it, it's one of the things that we'd like to do um, and, and make available to people. So uh, I encourage you to get hold of him. But as James has said, there are other products on the market from other suppliers, some of which in, in the later or um, newer cars, you can plug in yourself. And again, I would encourage you to go to the forum there was a discussion the other day from somebody who'd put in a module to allow Apple Play to work on their car in the States. And actually, there was an extremely good description on the forum of what they'd had to take apart and where they'd fitted wires in and how long it had taken them and everything else. So I encourage you all to go on the forum. And if you do do something like this and, 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 and can prove it out and, and everything else, write it up for the forum, because then it is a benefit to other people on there. Richard, okay. just saw a question pop up. Can I just, sorry, interrupt yeah. you for a moment. Uh, dash cameras, uh, something that's getting more and more prevalent now, uh, and certainly something that's incredibly useful. Now, um, personally, recommendation, uh, there's about three uh, that we think is the top quality ones. Uh, Qvia is a fantastic quality one, but aesthetically, it doesn't look fantastic. Um, there is Thinkware, which is a huge brand and very good quality, but again, um, Perhaps some of the aesthetics on some of the models aren't as pretty as others. Um, personal favorite is Blackview. Uh, we do an awful lot of those. Um, but one thing 
I would mention there's two options of wiring these in. You can either have it so it's on ignition key, so you turn the ignition key off and the camera switches off recording. A lot of owners like to have it recording whilst the car is left for um, damage prevention or certainly for evidence in case somebody decides to kick the corner, key the side of the car or whatever. Now, the vast majority of these uh, will wire to the ignition and also to permanent feed. However, um, I'm very mindful of the fact that Aston's can be temperamental on battery drain at the best of times. If we're adding things in that then cause battery drain, it can cause issues when you come to start the car again, certainly on early DBIs and very much so on vanquishing. Later ones, obviously better. Um, have a look at the option that we do as well of fitting an auxiliary battery pack to it. Now the battery pack then runs the camera whilst the car is parked up for anything up to nine or 10 hours. Now, most of these cameras will only wake up and record either when the car is knocked or when it sees movement. Now, cameras can be front and back. Um, obviously, with Volante, rear one's slightly more difficult. Um, so I'd only say front on that one. Uh, but it is a thought that if you're going to fit one and you want it to work all the time, get a battery pack just as a precaution because then you're not putting the onus on the car to run the camera and possibly flatten the car battery um, and you'll come back and obviously it then won't turn over and won't start. And uh, I have to second that. Uh, I have to confess that vanquishers, the early vanquishers, as everybody knows, are very sensitive to battery voltage. Uh, personally, I've bought a big um, uh, Nobo um, lithium ion battery pack. Um, and I know that it will start a, a V12 from totally flat. Um, it's got enough oomph in it. Um, and it's not much bigger than a, a sort of very small um, uh, A5 sized um, chunk. So um, I would, well, personally, I carry one everywhere I go. Um, but um, uh, different people do different things. Now, the James, there's a question here. Can the dash tams you fit be temporarily removed for countries where they're illegal? Austria, for yes. instance. Uh, yes, you can, yeah. Um, certainly with the Cuvia, it comes on the slide mount. Uh, the Thinkware, again, is a slide mount and just disconnect the power and the, um, what do you want, Blackview, um, disconnect the connectors and there's a release button and you can slide the whole body of the camera out from the mountings. So yes, each one you can be removed, either for, if, if you didn't want to leave the camera in there for, for theft prevention uh, or in cases where you do have to remove it, uh, then yes, just remove it simply like that. Mm. Okay, and um, there's a question here. Is it possible to connect an iPhone 11 or 12 to OBD2 and mount the phone facing forward out of the windshield to act as a collision avoidance ACC and level three system? Uh, that's, I'd need to do some research on, I don't know. The only thing I've seen so far, there's a uh, mapping system called Sigic which uses TomTom -tom technology. And I believe there's a app as part of that. You can use it as a dash camera as well. More than that, I don't know. Uh, if anybody's got any information, then I'd quite happy to look into it and find out some more. Okay. Um, there's a question now just popped up about the forum. So let me explain. Um, I'm one of the forum administrators. Um, if people... Um, are incorrectly registered as a guest rather than an AMOC member, or if people have lost how to get into the forum, if you send me an email um, to membership at amoc.org, um, I can put you back on the forum. And for the people who've lost their password, I can reset your password and things like that. So uh, on any forum questions, if you, if you simply ping me an email, um, I can I can connect you back up to the system, but um, I think it is the, the forum is probably the best place to put this information, which is easiest for everybody to get to. And so James and I will try and do a summary it, within the next week. I want to talk about something else quickly, which is that these sessions are videoed, uh, they're recorded by Maria and then posted. And because of what's been going on with trying to get the new website going. Maria has been distracted, is pretty well, uh, off on other tasks. So we are behind um, and we recognize that. 
Um, as a priority, we will put up the session from last week, which was Advantage V8, and then probably put this session up next and then try and catch up with the ones that went on before. Um, so we will try and get to them as fast as we can, um, but it is a question of resource, I'm afraid. Okay, um, uh, it's now virtually 12 o'clock. Um, if there are no more questions from everybody, um, I would um, suggest that we wrap this up. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining in. Um, we were at 84 James um, participants at its height, which is a, a very good turnout. Um, it's a, a great topic, rather complicated, and, and there is a lot of information here. But I think you've now got a resource um, as members to go to um, if you want to have specific questions answered. Um, and um, James is based in Tewkesbury, as you know. Um, and uh, as he's explained, he's got um, people who can install his systems around the world. So um, without further ado, thank you very much. Um, next week is Neil Calvert of Aston Workshop. Um, talking about the DB9. Uh, hopefully it will follow. Oh. <laughs> Looks like we've lost Richard. <laughs> Good job on on standby. I think he was just explaining what we're doing next week. There is a list gone out of the uh, the other uh, sessions we're doing uh, up until Christmas. If you, uh, you're interested, please register for that. And uh, I think that's about it. Poor Richard's definitely frozen, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, no, oh, is he thanks, back? Mark, for standing in. <laughs> oh, that's my job. James, thanks, much. <laughs> thanks very much to you. It's been absolutely brilliant and uh, intriguing to listen to that. Uh, have we got Richard back? Nope, he's gone. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>